Welcome to Conversations with Doc Martin. This video series focuses on extraordinary people doing extraordinary things. Today, we're joined by Brent Reinhardt, who is the Chief Marketing Officer for Chase's business banking organization. Brent oversees the marketing and products specifically targeted to the small business population. He leads a diverse organization of marketing professionals who manage branding, advertising, product development and management, client communications, digital strategy, social media, and innovation efforts. Brent has been with Chase since 2003 and held a variety of roles and was named to the Advocates 40 Under 40 for his work with the LGBTQ plus community, as well as driving change within JP Morgan Chase, specifically championing the first ever marketing campaign for Chase targeting to the LGBTQ plus community. Brent and his husband of 24 years live with their two dogs in Yardley, Pennsylvania, a suburb of Philadelphia, and a very warm welcome to my friend Brent. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. It's always it's always fun to hear your bio read back to you. You realize yes. how long it actually is. <laughs> that is absolutely true. That's absolutely true. I uh, I was so excited to have you on because you know full transparency. We're good friends. I've been to your wedding. We've known each other for years, and. Yes. I thought you'd be an absolutely wonderful person to kind of share your insights uh, with my audience, uh, not only because of your background, but your engagement with the LGBTQ plus community, as well as uh, observations that you've made over this crazy pandemic time. So it's it's certainly been a wild ride for all of us. That's it has good. been, man. Yeah. It's been. I don't I don't know that crazy is the right word. I <laughs> I used um, fever dream recently <laughs> in a in a meeting. Um, I was I was given a talk to folks at work, and I just y- y- you could have never imagined. I guess yeah. a lot of people imagined this was going to happen. But I think many of us couldn't have predicted it. Was going to happen. Well, absolutely. Crazy. And I mean, yeah. it, it's kind of fascinating because we've had this discussion over the years. My profession of dentistry was completely shut down. Yeah. Never happened before. Hopefully never yeah. happened again. And they're all small businesses. Exactly. And so we're, we're going to get into kind of your observation of small businesses and lessons learned, all that kind of good stuff. But, but you know, kind of before we go any further, uh, I think it might make some sense to kind of share with the audience like, what does a chief marketing officer do? I mean, I, I listed what you oversee, but yeah, walk us through what that actually means, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, listen, at the end of the day, my job is to hire people that are much more talented than I am in all of the specialties that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. And then my job is to sort of clear the runway for them mm-hmm. and make decisions. Okay. And so, you know, I don't, there isn't, there is, I, I will tell you, I don't even know if you know this or not, but I'm not a classically trained marketer. I didn't grow up in marketing. Mm-hmm. My, I, I, my undergrad was actually pre-med. I decided not to finish school. Mm-hmm. Um, and instead I went and got a job and then I went and got my MBA in marketing. Um, but I've done product development. I've done, you know, um, it's going to be operations type work, like mm-hmm. process improvement type work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I sort of fell into marketing. And so when you think about um, marketing in a company like Chase, and, and so what I do is it is very data driven. So a lot of people think marketing is like creative and heady. It isn't, at least in, in our company, we make decisions based on data. Yep. We make decisions based on learning. Um, and so we are we are constantly analyzing gathering data gathering information and so you know sort of my job is to interpret that for the broader audience Mm -hmm. the bigger part so so that's what i do as as chief marketing officer for my team the 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 bigger part of what i do i report to a ceo who runs a business runs business banking my job is, I feel, to be the voice of the customer at the table. Okay. And so I think at the end of the day, I should understand more about our customers' needs and wants and desires than anyone else around that table if I'm doing my job well. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like my job is to sit at her table and represent the customer in our decision-making process and as we're prioritizing where we're going to invest our resources and where we want to grow. Mm-hmm. So I think... You know, I've got responsibilities to my team and my organization. I also have responsibilities to our customers to represent them well as we're making business decisions. Yeah, absolutely. No, that that makes a lot of sense. And and being customer centric to be able to serve them better. And, you know, speaking of, 
you know, knowing the customers and, and uh, the client base. Share with us some of your observations of some of the, the fever dream. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to steal that, by the way. Um, so, so share with us some, some of the observations that you've made relative to, to those individuals, in, in all seriousness, that, uh, th- that not only just survive, but, but some individuals, you know, I know within the dentistry space, there were some that really suffered, there were some that struggled, and then there were some that thrived. And so what have you observed from some of the different uh, halls of different customers uh, that that you serve? Yeah. So I think, so, you know, no, no group is completely, you know, homogeneous, but I think as you think about small business owners in general, let's just Mm -hmm. sort of start up there. I think about small business owners in general, um, and you know this, they are incredibly resilient. You, Mm -hmm. you, nobody sort of straps their whole family's livelihood on their back and says, I'm not going to go work for a big company that gives me a 401k and vacation days. I'm going to go start this thing where I've got overhead and people I have to pay and no idea where my next paycheck is going to be. No one who's not optimistic and incredibly resilient takes that other path. So I think as, as a whole, small business owners are generally optimistic and, and, and they are problem solvers by nature because when you start, you are, the business owner, you're the only employee, you're the janitor, you're the guy who's got to figure out how to do social media, yep. you're the person who's got to figure out how to run payroll and pay themselves. And so you have to figure out how to solve problems on a day in day out basis. And I think that's what we saw by and large in the pandemic. Mm-hmm. So we saw among customers that we serve, we saw distilleries pivoting to make hand sanitizer. We saw restaurants who couldn't sell their food, donating their food to healthcare workers just because they had nothing else to do with it. Right. And, and we saw, you know, doctors and dentists figure out ways to continue to treat patients in incredibly unique ways. But I think we saw, you know, small business owners just continue to be incredibly resilient. The thing that I will say surprised me the most was new business formation is up. 30% year over year. So people are taking advantage of this time to say like, okay, maybe I lost my job, but I'm going to go and do the thing that I've always wanted to do. I I, I was surprised by the rate of new business formation that happened during the pandemic. Um, Excuse me. And I was, and I continue to be surprised by, um, you know, how many business owners are trying new things and you know are are just completely adapting their business model or changing the way they work mm-hmm. and i think we're going to see new businesses that we never knew existed come out of this in a way that will create whole new industries and whole new ways of working that's that's fascinating i mean it it goes along with your uh, description uh, categorically of small business owners as a whole that they're optimists, and so yeah. certainly uh, new starts being up thirty percent. That certainly speaks to to that mindset relative to yeah. uh, their optimism. What yeah. uh, you know, it's it's funny you were talking about businesses pivoting. There, there's one uh, restaurant here in Phoenix that really caught my attention because almost immediately they pivoted and they were selling uh, toilet paper. They were selling produce. They were, yeah. It was like fascinating to me how, yeah. how they pivoted and they're, they're still around and, and doing quite well. So I yeah. think that's fantastic. So, you know, when, when you think about optimism, uh, you did catch my ear because no, I didn't know that, uh, you know, you were, you were going down the pre-med path and kind of fell into marketing. And so yeah. I think that goes to, to your optimism as well, frankly, uh, because you, you have a very visible high level job you know, being uh, selected for 40 under 40 by the advocate, yeah. which is amazing. We'll get into the LGBTQ plus. It's a couple of years ago now. I'm not well, quite 40 anymore. That's so okay. Still that's okay. We, we, we can pretend. We can pretend. Yeah. And so um, how, how have you found your own journey through corporate America uh, relative to kind of your own optimistic uh, standpoint? And how, how has this been for you as a trajectory joining Chase in 2003. What, I guess maybe a better question would be, what are some of the lessons you learned through optimism in, in climbing the corporate ranks? Oh, it's a great question, Martin. It's a great question. Um, I think, it, so I have a, when I'm in an office, <laughs> when I'm in my office, <laughs> yeah. I have a poster on my wall and I, it, it's, a, it's a quote, it's a long quote by Charles Swindell, but the gist of it is, 
the gist of it is the famous, and it, I'll paraphrase it, but it's your attitude more than your aptitude determines your altitude. Um, and that's the paraphrase version of it. It's much longer. And so I have very much tried to always bring that attitude with me to the, of, of like, we can do this mm -hmm. to every project I've ever been on. And I wasn't kidding when I said, you know, I hire people who are much better and smarter than me. Um, you can't be intimidated by that because otherwise you're never going to have the best team and you're never going to have great growth. Mm -hmm. um, but it's more than that. It's, it's then, you know, impassioning people and giving people, giving people the free, the, the runway to really, you know, lead you in places that you never thought. And then to, 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 to drive with them that optimism that we're going to get, we're going to get it done. We're going to get through it. We're going to, we're going to do it. And I had a, I had a, a mentor early on in my career who used the phrase run to work. Mm -hmm. Like she didn't physically run to work, but her mm -hmm. mindset was always that you run towards hard work. Um, and I, I really embraced that at an early stage of my career. Mm -hmm. And so I raised my hand for every project that like people were like, that's going <laughs> to tank, that's going to fail, stay away, career killer. I raised my hand for every one of those. And you know what? Some of them failed. Some of them worked really well. But what it did is it exposed me to a bunch of different people around the organization in a way that I probably wouldn't have gotten exposure if I just stayed in my lane. And when those people moved up and needed to form their teams, they wanted people who had the same mindset as them. And so I, I for a chunk of my career, I got drafted behind them and it was, and it worked out fantastically well. Yeah. Um, and so I, I tried to take those lessons with me of just always being positive um, and always really running towards really hard work. Um, and I'll tell you, I never needed it more than this past year. The Paycheck Protection Program was probably the hardest work I've ever done, the mm -hmm. hardest thing I've ever lived through. Um, but, I, but I tried to keep that attitude throughout. Absolutely. No, that, that's absolutely fantastic. I love that, run, run to work. I've, I've never heard anything like that before and i'm i'm really going to take that to heart and you know the, we we all have the voice in our head and i talk about this quite often one of my favorite books of all time i might talk about this on every video so sorry viewers if i do but one of my favorite books of all time is the untethered soul by michael singer and he states you are not the voice in your head you're the one who hears it and so many people would want to put up their hand for that difficult project. And then the kind of the voice in their head kind of percolates in and, and they either don't raise it or, or they put it down. What, what do you think really made you put your hand up, especially in your early days? I have, um, and you know this about me personally, mm -hmm. I have zero fear of embarrassment. Like sure. it is, I have, I, yeah, <laughs> 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 um, so I think, um, now that's not to say that I don't take things incredibly personally and I, right. don't, I don't strive for excellence. That's not what I'm saying at all. Um, what, but, but I also, I believe that in, in failure comes growth. Mm -hmm. And so, like I said, those projects that everybody wanted to shy away from because they thought they were career killers, I never viewed them as career killers. I viewed them as a learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think if you approach things and I'll tell you how, and if, if you want, I can tell you how I sort of plotted my career, which is also sure. a learning opportunity yeah. piece. But I, but, but I think if you approach things as a learning opportunity, um, you have a, you, your perspective shifts a bit. Yeah. And I have, I, I tell all of my teams, like my father growing up, I don't like to quote my father often because I don't like to admit that he was right. Um, but my father growing up, we used to ski a lot as a family. And my father growing up told me, if you're not falling, you're not skiing hard enough. You're not mm -hmm. learning. Mm. Um, and I tried to take that into a business mindset and say, okay, if you're not failing, you're not actually learning, you're not pushing the boundaries, you're not growing. If everything is working, you're doing something wrong. Um, and so I try to instill that in my team. That's the mindset of like, that led me to raise my hand. And mm -hmm. so um, that's sort of the philosophy that sits in the back of my brain. That's the voice in the back of my head. Like if everything, if I'm having an easy week, 
Mm -hmm. that means next week's going to be really crappy because something's about to blow up, but I didn't see it. You know what I mean? Like, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I think those are really, really profound words because so many, it, it's fascinating because there's so many people that are, that are afraid to fail, but there's also so many people that are afraid to succeed. Like, oh my God, what happens if it works? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll take that problem all day long. Like, like why, yeah. why is that a challenge? So I, I think those are, those are really, really wise words. And, um, when, when you think about your career and you think about the, the uh, ability to embrace failure mm -hmm. and you know, you're, you're a gay man, you're very public, you're 40 under 40 and the yeah. largest circulating uh, magazine there is, I think for our community. Um, how has been the, you know, coming up through the ranks in corporate America yeah. been for you as yeah. a gay man? Yeah. Um, so it's been through a couple of phases. Mm -hmm. um, early on in my career, um, I was what I would call honestly gay, not openly gay. Okay. Um, and so if anyone asked, I always vowed I would never lie. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I've been with my husband for 24 years. I mean, like I always had a, I always had a partner. I always had, you know, I, I, we weren't always married, but I always had a partner. Um, and so I, and so I would, I didn't tell people, but I didn't shy away if someone said, oh, you know, do you have a girlfriend or a wife? And I would say, no, I have a boyfriend or a husband mm -hmm. at the time, depending. Um, and then somewhere along the line, but I will tell you, like, importantly, it wasn't a C yet. I didn't, I hadn't made the chief yet. Uh, but right. Somewhere along the line in my sort of VP director days, which is a couple levels down, I made the decision to live openly gay and not honestly gay. Mm -hmm. And that was incredibly, it was freeing. It allowed me to be, you know, we talk about, like a lot of companies talk about bring your whole self to work. Yep. And I think people who haven't ever had to do that don't understand the true beauty in actually bringing them their whole selves to work. Amen. Um, yeah. I, I found myself sitting in meetings and I could tell, like, a lot of times I maybe didn't tell a story because of the, like, honestly, not openly. Yep. And it was relevant to making a business decision. And when I decided to be openly gay, I had no problem telling that story. And I could guide conversations in a much different way. And I could drive conversations in a much different way. And I had never expected that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and the side benefit of it, so that was like side benefit one. Side benefit two is more junior people started to reach out to me and say, I really appreciate you saying that or like on a stage saying my husband and I are showing a picture of us together or, um, you know, making a making a funny joke about drag queens in the middle of a boardroom meeting. <laughs> and, you know, like, which I, again, no embarrassment. Um, <laughs> and so like, you know, I, I just, and so it became this thing where I realized then as I did climb, mm -hmm. I not only, it not only benefited me, but I had an obligation to be out at work. Mm -hmm. um, and I had an obligation for people whose experience hasn't been as wonderful as mine to show them that there are very senior people in this company who are out and proud and loud about it and who say things that push the envelope and who drive conversations in a way that maybe makes their coworkers uncomfortable, but they need to get used to it. Mm -hmm. And, and so it, be, it, it evolved from honestly gay to openly gay to, to sort of advocacy gay mm -hmm. um, at work. And I think, you know, I, listen, I hold no, mis no misconceptions about how privileged my life has been. Not everyone shares that experience. Yeah. Um, but I've been able to ma to manage it in such a way that I think has helped me. No, I, I think that's fantastic. I, and, you know, openly gay versus honestly gay and then, or the other way around, and then being an advocate. What, what, a, what, a, what a wonderful way to kind of put your own personal journey into kind of a, um, a way that others can, can think about their own journeys and, and yeah. where they are and, and what might work for them. Because we both know 
you know, living in major metropolitan areas, this this is an opportunity for us to live yeah. as as we are, but but that doesn't exist for everybody. Exactly. And so what I was excited to talk to you anyway, because just I was. And there were a couple of things that I learned. And and one of the things that struck me is that you work for an international company. Yeah. That we all know, even if you're not a client. And the, the very idea that my friend Brent was behind or had a key play in the first campaign to the LGBTQ plus community yeah. puts a face to a large corporation. And when I think about what you just shared and I think about the gravity of that statement, because think about it, like 20 years ago, would Chase ever do that or any other company yeah. of its ilk and size? Yeah. And, and so I would love to hear, and, and I know nothing about this. I would love to hear like how that came about. What yeah. was the first conversation you had, like how it went down and tell us a little bit about the history of, of, of that initiative. Yeah. So I sort of backdoored my way into it um, intentionally, which is we, um, we were launching Sapphire. And mm -hmm. so for those of you who don't know, uh, um, so I was involved, I, I led the, project team that built and launched the original version of Chase Sapphire back in 2008-2009. Um, and we were launching the product and it was a product that was geared towards the affluent, uh, what we called the aspiring affluent. Um, so what we didn't want to be is we didn't want to be Amex, who is sort of this brand around you've arrived membership has its privileges right that's a country club mm -hmm. we didn't want to be that we wanted to be much more open about you know it's not a membership thing it's the card that fuels your dreams fulfills your life um and that was some that was some of the brand that we were building around um and driving and so we identified this this segment when you're doing product development it really helps if you have sort of your target your your ideal customer in mind Sure. Um, and, and we had this ideal customer that was this aspiring affluent person. So they weren't yet there, but they were on their way. Um, we also refer to it sometimes as the little black dress that's in every woman's closet and some men's closets, like that dress that is completely, completely functional. And it, yeah. it'll take you from the neighborhood pub all the way up to a ball, right? Yeah. Like it's exact, it's what you need. And so um, that's what we were striving for. And so when we were launching the product, um, we, you know, when we, when you go into a media buy, you actually try and find the, the, the publications, demographics and placements that are going to reach your target customer. And then you hit that bullseye and you sort of radiate out from there. Um, and so the LGBT community as a whole is, um, fits that demographic. Um, and so we, we presented a media buy in Out Magazine as one of the options in the media plan. And when we landed on it, that we said, okay, now you can't go into Out Magazine with a heterosexual couple. I mean, you can, there are brands that do that, but like I, we, I personally, we didn't feel it was appropriate to go into Out Magazine in our first campaign and show a, like literally take the ad we were running nationwide and slap it into a gay LGBT targeted publication. Right. And so we, we did a, a visual ad instead of having to go shoot something, we did a, you know, a graphic ad mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that would work towards the LGBT population. Um, and so we, uh, and so that's how it came about. It's sort of, we, we backdoored our way into it by like recommending the ad, recommending the publication mm -hmm. and then rec mm -hmm. recommending the, the, that we change the ad to reach a specific, to prove that we were speaking to the LGBT, LGBT plus population. And we did that with the support of our pride organization and, and like with their backing and with their mm -hmm. recommendation. And so I think it was a, it was a perfect example where a, we call them BRG, business resource group yeah. can help drive a business in a new direction. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think that's absolutely fantastic. And what year was that, by the way? Oh, God, I'll go back and find the find the ad. I think it was 
I think by the time it went into market, it was 2010, but I can okay. tell you, uh, okay. I can follow up with the exact date. Okay. Okay. Follow up with the, with the date and issue number. <laughs> I think it, I think it, I think they, the company re-aired it in my 40 under 40, which I know shockingly, I still have a copy of. Um, so <laughs> no, I think that's fantastic. I'm, I'm also curious, was there any uh, blowback or resistance that you got from the public about Chase taking a stand in that way? I'm yeah. kind of curious. That's Nothing. Awesome. I will tell you our national ca- our national launch campaign got more blowback than the LGBT huh. one. Interesting. Um, primarily because we focused, so just re- we did focus the LGBT ad in LGBT focused media. So it wasn't like it was that's true. Like, it wasn't like it was the first gay couple from Chase that's kissing true. on TV. Yeah. Um, but our launch ad um, showed a, a a woman in a who tried to demonstrate the versatility of the sapphire points, and so it showed a woman modeling her new dress for her husband. And he's thinking of all of these great things they can do with their Sapphire points in like a dream sequence. And she's like, I already did because the points were so flexible. Like, it's... And so the American Family Association, which is apparently this like heavily conservative outlet mm-hmm. that like claims to have 40,000 members, but probably has three people sitting in a keyboard. Um, um, literally like bo- called for a boycott of us because the woman depicted was so selfish that she spent the points on a dress as opposed to promoting her family. So that ad got more blowback oh, wow. than the LGBT ad. That's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, all those, it's all those backstories that nobody ever hears that yeah. really fascinate me. Uh, I don't yeah. know. I don't know if I'm, a, I'm unique in that or not, but, but I, lo- <laughs> I love that kind of stuff. And so I think that's great. I, I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit more. You, may, you made a comment about the more junior members of, of the team at Chase, if I may, yeah. uh, coming in and thanking you for, for being visible. And so when, when you think about um, the community, uh, I'm going to ask you two, two parts and, and you might, yeah. might choose to combine them, you might choose not to, but... When, when, you, when you think about, you know, a, a younger LGBTQ plus entrepreneur or a younger mm-hmm. entrepreneur, like mm-hmm. what kind of advice would you give them about fortitude and optimism? I mean, yeah. you shared the whole concept of running to work and, and the poster in your office. You have exposure to, to all these different clients yeah. and you've seen the good, bad, and the ugly. And yeah. so what kind of advice would you give to somebody who's, who's, who's starting out let, let's go with the business first. Sorry for being round robin. Let's go no, with the business. First. Okay. What would you What would you say to a younger person or a yeah. period starting out in, in a business? What What advice would you give them? Yeah. So this advice. So I give uh, I give this advice regardless of whether you're LGBT plus or you identify as straight or whatever, however you identify. I would give this piece of advice to everyone, which is which is get get your team and I'm air quoting team sure um purposely get your team in place before you do anything and that team should be a really good accountant a really good lawyer preferably a really great banker from Chase but (laughs) you should have someone and I'm not gonna someone with financial acumen sure and the most important part of that team in addition to those three is a truth sayer mm. because we all think our ideas are the best thing since sliced bread. Yeah. But like if one, if there's one, if you're building a product for yourself, there's only one person who can build, who's going to use that product. Yeah. And so we, so I've seen so many businesses fail because they don't have that. They don't have that advisory board mm-hmm. to go to. And I'm using like sort of formal terms, but they could be, I might use you, Martin, as my truth there because I know you're going to tell you. I know you're going to look at me and say that's the stupidest idea ever. <laughs> right? Like, don't spend a million dollars of your life savings trying right. to get that off the ground. It's never going to go anywhere. Yeah. Or at least someone who's willing to ask the question: Did you? Who is your target customer? And did you research this? So anything anyone's about to do, they've got to have that air quotes team around mm-hmm. them. They're not people on the payroll. They can be your friends and family, but they got to be willing to tell you the truth, mm-hmm. and you've got to be willing to listen. I think that's great. If, yeah, thank you. If you are LGBT plus, um, that then is a very personal decision. And I don't pretend that it's not even in this day. I don't think we are, like, I think people, 
you know, it's very easy if you live in Philadelphia or New York or Phoenix to think that we're like over the hurdle of this thing and like all gays or LGBT plus are accepted and it's perfect. But like, I have friends who are trans or going through the trans journey and it is a completely different environment, yep. even in Philadelphia or New York. I have friends who live in, you know, Ohio or Montana or Louisiana where being gay is still a completely different environment. Yep. So I would just say the most important thing is your authenticity. Whether you want to be a small business owner and have the best five stores of the burger chain in your town or whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. or whether you want to be a fast growth entrepreneur who goes out and seeks venture capital, mm -hmm. you, you will be seen through if you are not authentic. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't mean you have to wear your outness on a sleeve and to put a big sign up and a rainbow flag out. It just means that you have to be authentic to you in your brand, in your product, in your promise, in your development. Um, and so I think that can take many shapes and forms. There's no, I, but that would be my advice. That's great. No, that that's fantastic. Just I realized that I was just talking there for a oh, second. Oh, no, no, no. It's I great. I lost my own train. Hopefully no, I, no the, 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 the being authentic and, and being true to yourself and, and really thinking about who do I want to be? And, and you know, in, in the words of Simon Sinek, the famous words, you know, finding your why, you know, yeah. what, why am I doing this? Who am I? What am I going to do? You know, all those, all those important questions that, that we need to ask ourselves before we take kind of any leap. So mm -hmm. I, I, I've really enjoyed our time today. And, and I guess, uh, you know, it was such a, it was such a great way to kind of cap our conversation. It, it, it spurned in my brain, a final question I want to ask you. Okay. And the final question I want to ask you is this. If, I'm nervous. If, <laughs> if you look at the totality of your life, mm -hmm. personally, professionally, it doesn't matter. It's up to you. You may choose to do both. What are you most proud of? Um, wow, that's a good question. Um, I think... I'll, I'll, I'll give you two answers. Okay. Personally, um, I, I have to say that I think it is um, my, you know, you know, my husband and I, mm -hmm. um, but I think my husband and I have a fantastic relationship mm -hmm. and in an LGBT relationship to last 24 years. Um, how long are you, Michael? Uh, it'll be 26 this year. Yeah. So I knew, I knew, I knew you were like close. I couldn't remember yeah, you were close yeah, up or close yeah. over, but yeah. So you know this, like, I think I am most proud of making our relationship work and be as successful as it is. Cause I think that it's, it's naive to say that it doesn't take a ton of, a ton of work from both parties involved. And so I think I'm most proud of that personally. Professionally. Um, I think I'm proud of the honesty and transparency and authenticity with which I've managed my career mm -hmm. um i have never done anything that i have that i wouldn't ask someone i've never asked someone else to do something that i wouldn't do myself i have never i've never once compromised my principles i have never once um spoken not spoken when i thought i should mm -hmm. um sometimes to my detriment mm -hmm. um <laughs> but so i think i think i'm let, more than any one single accomplishment, I think I'm proud of that. And I hope that I carry that through me the rest of my career. That, that's amazing. And, and, you know, if I may, it, it follows along everything you've said in terms of the optimism and running toward work and, and being yeah. open and being true. I mean, it's, it's all, it all makes sense. It all makes yeah. sense. So I really, 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 really want to think. This was so fun. much fun. This it was, it was, so much fun. It, was yeah. it was, it was. So we're going to go ahead. We're going to, um, post your LinkedIn profile um, below. Great. And uh, I just, again, want to sincerely thank you. And I want to share with everyone to please don't forget and hit the subscribe button and click notifications so you don't miss out on our next guests. And lastly, remember, life speaks to you. And if you think it doesn't, you're not listening. Take care. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks.